Hello and welcome to the Sports Code Podcast. My name is Ryan Walker and with me as always is the code breaker, Ruben Williams. How are you, mate? <laughs> G'day, Ryan. I'm fantastic. Thank you. My coding skills aren't that uh, well equipped just yet, but uh, it's always been one of those things. I'd love to be able to code. It sounds like a very useful skill, but I'll get around to it one day, Ryan. Yeah, I uh, I look, yeah, I'm a little bit the same. I guess I'd love to code. I'm just not sure I'd be great at it, but happy to give it a crack. Oh, I believe in you, Ryan. I reckon you can. I reckon you've got it in you. Well, that that is ultimately all that matters. So, <laughs> thank you, mate. Thank you. Maybe we'll become coders together. I think so. <laughs> Speaking of coders, let's get cracking on the episode. Um, but before we do, a quick message from our good friends at Deakin University where every single course is backed by industry experts. So you can be confident you'll get the job you want with a degree employers want. Deakin University, progressive real world learning. Ryan, this show is also brought to you by our good friends at Sports Where I Am. The Adelaide Test Match is coming up, Ryan. We've got Binook working for the Adelaide Crows. Anyone heading over there for the Test Match? in South Australia in the, on the, what is it, 16th of December? 16th, yeah. If you want an ultimate experience, head to sportswhereiam.com where you can get find all your favourite sports, grab tickets, and use the code SPORTSGRAD to get 5% off at the same time. How good is that, Ryan? It's pretty good, but Rubes, I can do better than that. If you want <laughs> the, the ultimate experience, this is called the, the SPORTSGRAD slash SPORTSWHEREIAM experience. So mm. you can get your tickets to the Adelaide Test from Sports Where I Am which is on the 16th, but you can also come to the sports crowd meetup on the 15th, which is the night before the test. And that'll basically just get you raring and ready to go for the mm. cricket the next day. Um, yep. So that is happening at on the 15th, 6 p.m. at the West Oak Hotel, uh, which is going to be a river because we haven't been to Adelaide before. No, um, cannot wait to meet all of our Adelaide people. Yeah, so it's very exciting. Uh, for us as well. So come along. Everyone is welcome. Uh, If you want to learn more about who we are or want to ask us any questions, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. You can find a link to do so in the show notes. Righto, Rubes, today, huge guest. We've been waiting a long time to have this man on uh, and it was an absolute ripper, if I will say so myself. So who is he? Ryan, you're absolutely right. We're, today we are chatting with Binook Kodutawaku, who has had an extraordinary career after going through five and a half years at, at law school. He found his way into to player management and then into to analytics and has worked at some incredible organizations like the Washington Wizards, Sports Bet, Points Bet, uh, and he even started his own consultancy agency to work for a number of different uh, AFL clubs alongside being the head of analytics and football operate, football innovation at the Adelaide Crows. And where now he has just got like the most incredible job. If you're into analytics, this is like the, this is as good as it gets. And now he's about to head off to the US to study and do some research over at Duke University whilst consulting for the Adelaide Crows as well. So you know, you talk about a oh, yeah. uh, a portfolio career. This is as good as it gets in my mind. Yeah, absolutely. And the, I mean, the episode didn't disappoint. It it, it sounds exactly as it was uh, going through his career. So, what were some things that stood out to you, mate? Well, so these analytics people, they're always very methodical in the way they approach things, and their career is no different. What I loved about hearing from from Binock was his own career plan that he came up with. You know, he talks about the way that he just kind of set out his objective and worked his way through it, you know, right from when he left school all the way to where he's a head of department and became a head of department at the age of 29. So, you know, if you need a system in career development to follow, his is a pretty good one. Yeah, I I love these, uh, what I'm going to call high-level networking. And he takes us through... uh, what that looks like but let's just say you just said methodical uh if there's a way to methodically work through your network and who you want to speak to then binok pretty much did that spot on so Mm. uh that was a highlight for me yeah while still being a great person is very easy to to get along with Mm. and then finally the uh the the big ticket of binok's job is draft night 
and he walks us through absolutely everything he does to prepare for it, what it looks like on the night, how they make decisions. Like we're talking about the top players in the AFL, how they decide who gets picked on draft night and how the trades are done as well. Like Ryan, I'm I'm ready to, you know, you know, listen back to this when I go back and do my fancy uh, super coach team uh, in a few weeks' time. But um, yeah. yeah, the behind the scenes look at his job was just incredible, Ryan. I do need a bit of help with my fantasy, so I've um, I might have to book Binook for a couple of hours pre-draft just to just so. to go through all the possibilities. But in the meantime, grab a pen, enjoy this chat with Binook Kotodawaku. <laughs> Binook, welcome to the Sportscope podcast. Thanks, mate. Thanks uh, for you guys for having me on. Pleasure to have you, Binook. I'm just uh, I'm having a look at your LinkedIn profile right now. I've scrolled right down to the bottom where it says Bachelor of Laws and Bachelor of Commerce. And then when you scroll up from there, just about every single experience is related to analytics in sport. And there's a bit of a disconnect here. So you can tell us a bit about where did your interest come from? And when did you start to think that a career in analytics was going to be a thing? Yeah, so I actually studied law with Ryan's brother, Emerson. He's a good man. and um, my... He'd be listening, so shout out to Emma. <laughs> yeah, he better be. <laughs> um, so I, throughout like my, um, like throughout growing up, like I played a lot of cricket and I was really passionate um, about cricket and um, went to Sri Lanka to play some cricket as well and then realised, well, oh, probably wouldn't make it as a cricketer, um, but then had a great fallback option um, to study law, which, um, you know, back in high school, you thought law degree, it's a good degree to have, um, everyone telling me to do it. Um, I had a little bit of a passion for law, but that was based on what I saw on TV, not the real uh, grunt of studying law. And anyway, so within my second year of law school, I realised that this probably wasn't the career for me and um, I just wasn't passionate about it. And I'm somebody who was pretty driven. I just realised that um, there were so many other equal like intelligent people studying law that loved it and that I was never going to be as good as them um, or as successful as them in law. So I needed to find something that I was as passionate about and um, it was sport. So sport was always um, at the forefront of my mind um, and I wanted to make a career out of it. And when I was coming through uni over a decade ago now, there was nothing like the things that you guys are doing with sports grad, which is great. Um, there was no pathway. I had to create my own pathway and there was a lot of networking, a lot of cold calls, a lot of cold emails a lot that went unanswered. Um, but yeah, so through that, I've been able to forge that career in sport. And then as that's evolved and gotten more of an understanding of the gaps in the market um, and the kind of the part of the sports industry I want to work in, that's how the analytics side developed. And, um, you know, I'd really need to upskill myself on some of the, like the mathematical stuff and some of the coding things. Um, and then, yeah, with that base understanding, was able to create something pretty compelling um, for, for an AFL club. And, yeah, that kind of journey um, was pretty interesting. So did you do all that after your law degree or during it? Because, you know, second year of a law degree is a, a long time to stick it out to get to the mm. end of it to do something new. Like, so where did it all kind of fit in? Yeah, so I, um, in the second year of law school, I then, um, the career that I thought about that would fit with the law degree was to be a player agent, um, obviously, because they negotiate contracts and, um, there's that relevance with the, the law degree. And I reached out to, I think, every player agent um, in Western Australia. That's where I studied. And a lot of them didn't get back to me. Um, some that I'm really good friends with now, like we laugh about it. They never um, reply, replied to my email. Um, <laughs> but um, there was one agency that was kind of starting up. Um, they didn't really have an AFL division at the time and they wanted to um, establish that. And I knew a few of my friends, um, younger brothers that were going into the draft. Um, so I said, look, I can probably get you guys an interview or a meeting with these guys and um, let's see what value I can add to the business. And after a few of those um, conversations with the players and with myself, they kind of um, saw my what I could bring to the table and they added me um, you know, into the business, which was exciting. We had a few AFL players drafted. Um, the best success story out of all of them was probably Jason Johannesson, who won the uh, Norm Smith medal in 2016. And he was an unheralded prospect. And um, I just really liked his speed. Um, so... Yeah, we were probably one of the first ones to speak to him, um, which was a great story. And then from there, I realised that I didn't really want to um, be on the agent side. I loved the team side, like building teams and 
um, all the machinations that go into finding players and then paying them the right amount to keep the group together, who you want to bring in through the draft or by trade. And that's when I saw analytics as my pathway in because obviously I'd never played um, footy at a high level or other sports like US sports. So, um, yeah, then kind of self-taught my way into that and uh, got a really good opportunity at Sportsbet, which helped me to learn those skills as well. So was the, the analytics part that you taught yourself, was that your influence on, say, signing Jason Johannesson as a player with your agency? No, you so the analytics the part was after. So the agency okay. part was, yeah, it was a lot more um, like gut feel and just well, at the time we were a startup, so we were just trying to get in front of as many people as we could and see who would sign with us. But, yeah, it was a really enjoyable experience and it's helped me now with negotiations mm. with you know, other teams at Trade Period and, and agents themselves. And, and when you're still a student and you're getting in front of those sort of people, like what, what's your role in those conversations? Yeah, so it was um, a really good time because we had, I know with you guys with the cricket background, um, Ryan Campbell was one of the founders of the oh, agency. Yeah. Yep. Um, and he like the and he was great. Yeah, the scoop, the scoop stuff. Um, <laughs> and so it was me, him, and another guy called Paul Tonich, and then there was a lawyer um, as well. And we would just go into meetings and I would talk to the players more about their footy, um, with my understanding of footy and, and where they fit. And um, the other guys would talk more to the parents and reassure them that, you know, it was a promising thing to sign with this startup agency and the benefit of that. So, um, yeah, at that time, I think I was about 20. So I don't think many parents would listen to what a 20-year-old would say about the best decisions <laughs> for their son. So I kept it uh, to the footy. Yeah, no. And was this watch his face management? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so nice. that um, I pretty much did that from uh, second year uni all the way till I finished. Yeah. Um, no, that, that's great. And how did you sort of go from no involvement to some involvement? Like, was it mutual friends or did you sort of network your way into it? Like, how did you sort of become involved? Yeah, so it was all network. Like, it was um, 100% network and it wasn't... Just like, so once you get into watch this space, like that was great to do it and it was a startup. But then um, like the next steps in my career as well, like I went to the US after that, there was a lot of networking that had to go into that. And then coming back to Australia and wanting to break into the AFL, like even more networking. So the networking side of it never really stopped. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the, the constant, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you mentioned the US in there. Um that's when I sort of started to really take note of Binook. Uh, I'd, I'd obviously met you before then, uh, but your career just kind of went berserk when I heard that you were heading over to the US. Can you <laughs> tell us a little bit about sort of what that was like and sort of what what was it like for someone who wanted to be in analytics but wanted to work in the US coming from Australia? Was that just so hard to get your head around? Yeah, like that was, oh, it was a super fun experience. I loved it. Um, and I think back fondly on it. So when I went over there, um, I knew that obviously the agency background would help. So I was reached out to a lot of um, sports agents in the US. And again, like a similar story where you're reaching out, sending emails to hundreds of people and you might get five back. And then out of those five, there might be one that leads to a catch up. A lot of them are just saying, um, you know, we're not looking for people or thank you, we'll keep your resume on file. So um, there was a lot of that, but was fortunate to get a um, an internship uh, with a agency in Colorado. So moved to LA first um, and was staying with my cousin while I was kind of navigating what the opportunities were in the US and then moved to Colorado, uh, which was a completely different experience. So not um, Denver, it was more uh, Colorado Springs, which is a very conservative part of the US. So there were some learnings there. Um, that I wasn't exposed to, um, which have obviously been amplified in recent times. But then that was a really good experience just to see how different it was like an NFL agent and what they need to do and what they were competing against because um, these guys were really good. Um, they had a lot of first-round draft picks um, historically and then there were some newer agents that were kind of taking over um, from their turf and what they had to do to keep players, how they went about recruiting players. It's a completely different system because here we're recruiting or well, agents recruit players at 18, whereas in the NFL it's uh, 20, 21, 22-year-olds that are in college. And um, there's obviously heaps of stories about different inducements that um, agents give and how, um, you know, the ethical agents act and then you know, they have to starve off the non-ethical agents. So that was fascinating. Um, but then that's when I really realised that, um, yeah, I really, really wanted to be on the team side, especially after being exposed to that in the US. Um, 
and then was fortunate that there was a startup um, basketball technology company um, called Synergy Sports back in the day. Um, and then they, what they did was they were, they were kind of uh, a video software company where teams could analyze um, plays and that helped them with recruiting. And then because of Synergy, a competitor came up called Vantage Sports that tried to take what Synergy did to the next level. And they were looking for people that understood basketball and could, uh, un- had a base understanding of statistics to develop some articles and things that they could then give out to teams. So um, I was fortunate that I'd started a blog again at uni on US sports and they'd seen the blog and they reached out to me to do some work for them. Um, and then through that, I was able to network with a lot of NBA teams, which was awesome. And then um, got an opportunity on the commercial side. So not on the sports side, but um, there were some visa issues and things like that. So on the commercial side with the Washington Wizards, um, where I worked for a season, which was awesome. And that um, that experience, even though it wasn't technically in the area of sport I wanted to work in, it was just such a good learning to see what the amount of revenue that's in the US um, when it comes to tickets, sponsorships, marketing, um, and just how much bigger that industry is than, than over here. But um, yeah, that experience was great, just so I could learn as well about analytics and get exposed to some NBA teams. There must be something at law school that where they tell everyone to to write a blog, because you're the second lawyer who's come <laughs> to this podcast who has said, you know, you should write a blog as a way to get a job. Uh, Garth Town, who's a commercial counsellor at the International <laughs> Olympic Committee and is episode 16, if anyone wants to look him up, Um at, we asked him at the very end of his interview, what advice would you give to grads looking to break in the, into the industry? And he said, write a blog, get your work out there and have people notice you. And you've done exactly that to get into the US. So something about blogs and lawyers that mm. uh, is making a lot of sense at the moment. But um, yeah, um, yeah. what what was the um, the job market like for, for analysts at the time? Like after you had this experience, mm. where do you go next? Yeah, so then I, um, because of, really like I love the experience of the Wizards but it wasn't the area of sport I wanted to work in and then um with visa limitations like I was in New York I'll come back like I love the AFL come back and see what I could get in the AFL and really I knew then like it was great because I had perspective on what skills I needed to develop to become like a really good analyst and to get into that space um and to understand the numbers and things like that I wasn't that keen to go back to uni and study a formal degree at the time just coming off a law degree, which was five and a half years and didn't really want to go back at that time. Um, Pretty done after five and a half, I would have thought. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, And then, yeah, there was an opportunity at Sportsbet. Um, They were looking um, for like a sports trader to kind of understand odds and um, like the mathematical computations that go into um, pricing up sporting events. And I wasn't a big punter or anything like that, but I just knew that if I went into that role, like the skills that I'd be exposed to and the people I'd be exposed to um, would just be, you know, second to none. And um, within Australia at the time, like it was the sports betting companies that were doing um, the heavy analytics, the sporting teams weren't. So there was no other place for me to get exposure to data and sport um, apart from that. Mm. So, yeah, that was a great experience. Like I loved I loved my time there and learned a lot and still keep in touch with a lot of the guys there that, um, yeah, doing some really cool things. Yeah, it um, it's an interesting one because like you've gone and got that role f- for one reason, like you want to learn analytics. Yeah, and like at the moment, Rubes, like we've got all, we've got so many roles right that have been sent through to us that we're putting out to our sort of members at Sports Grad, and some of them are like, oh, you know, I don't necessarily want to go into that exact area of sport, and a lot of them are like internships, and what we're sort of saying is like. It doesn't matter if you don't want to be a social media guru at a at a sporting club, but if you go and do an internship for six months, the knowledge that you're going to get from that actual area of sport is going to help you when you go and you want to work in commercial. Like it, it all works. Mm. So if you can direct a specific skill and just go and learn that quickly, and then go back to what you sort of really, really want to do, like there's obvious advantages there. So it's it's interesting how you've just gone and you've plucked that knowledge straight away so you can progress in your career. Yeah, I think I think that's an important part of it because sport, um, also there's um, so Cheryl Sandberg who kind of, uh, she's the CEO at Facebook, she gave a speech where I listened to where she said that careers are no longer a ladder. They're like a jungle gym where you go up, you go sideways, you go back, like, 
and then you kind of find, but you just got to find mm. that jungle gym you want to play at. And like for me, that sport and knowing that, like I kind of had like a brief outline of the path I wanted to get on, but it wasn't going to be linear because, you know, I wanted to be in this type of role where I was working on the list stuff and, um, you know, this side of um, a sporting team, but I knew I needed to get skills to make myself attractive. And yeah. that meant kind of yeah going backwards and sideways and doing a fair bit. When you say you had a brief plan or outline, what, what, what did that look like? Because I know you're a very proactive person, so I don't doubt you've probably, you know, done a bit of fleshing this out. Yeah. So my ideal goal, I think, was like is to run a team one day, um, whether that be in Australia or in the US, wherever it is, like um, in a sport I'm really passionate about. So my goal was to kind of meet as many people who are currently doing that job because that's the job that I want to have. And it was then, okay, where, what are their pain points? And then understanding those pain points and then upskilling myself in that to then be able to get a role, um, you know, that adds some value to them. Because there's, again, like this goes to a lot of um, students that reach out to me as well. Um, I, I want to catch up. I want to um, get into your area of sport. It's like, well, okay, but you know, there's a hundred of you. Like, how are you going to differentiate yourself <laughs> and what value will you bring? So I think that's a key, the key learning that I had early was I just want to, understand like the role I want to get into and then how can I add value to the person currently in that role that then you know I need to become like their right hand man and um, yeah develop it from there. So it sounds like it was a process of working backwards from your end goal and just figuring out where you could fill in the problems. Yeah no 100% I think um, just having a broad idea of what I wanted to do and then understanding okay let's try get there and then even if I don't reach that pinnacle at least I'll have some pretty fun roles. So like my role now, like I absolutely love it at the Crows. Like it's exactly what I want to be doing. Love it. Let's um let's jump forward slightly. Um, and you actually run your own analytics consulting business outside of your role at the Crows, which we'll get into get onto in a moment. But what was the uh the inspiration behind building that and, and what's some of the specific work that you're doing? Yeah, so the way that started, that was actually Whilst I was at Sportsbet, um, I'd been I wanted to network with AFL list managers because I knew that was the space I wanted to get into. And um, Fremantle's list manager at the time, Brad Lloyd, who's now at Carlton, he um, said, "Look, there's an opportunity for you to come in as a consultant um, and to put some things together." And that's when I kind of got that idea. Okay, well, teams might not because the AFL at the time um, and still is probably pretty na- um, not naive, but it's, there's a long way to go when it comes to sports analytics. So teams yeah. were interested in dabbling in it without probably investing full time in those type of resources. So that's where I got the idea from. And then throughout that time, um, there were, I thought, well, I can do this for the AFL. I can do it for other sports as well. Like got some opportunities um, within the NRL at a couple of clubs to develop, um, you know, like an analytics capability for them, which was really interesting because it's a completely different sport, different rules. If the AFL's say 10 years behind where the US sports are, the NRL is probably five to 10 years behind that. So um, that was fascinating and just a lot of good learnings and then had some really good conversations with various cricket teams as well to build out their capability. Um, and then, yeah, that, that's that's been the driving force for that, um, which was great. When, and when then, you say build out their capability, do you literally mean show them the platforms, tell them how to use it, derive insights from it? What What is that? Yeah, so it means mainly like so because I'm in the player evaluation space, it's how can you guys um, kind of see value in players that the eye probably misses? So what are the data insights telling us about which players should we pick? So if it's, um, you know, an NRL or AFL context, which players should we bring in through the draft for the AFL and for the NRL through our junior systems with cricket? Like it's a lot more matchup specific um, and probably less about the recruitment side of it. Um, so a lot of these things are just really great um, conversations and great learnings that I had. And then um, obviously when I was with the Crows, um, that that became the focus. And then recently um, decided that next year I'll be actually going back to the US to do my MBA. Um, so now the Crows um, will be like a team that I consult for as well, which is great. Um, so I'll still be doing that. So then I can continue to build out other clients um, throughout the journey. That's awesome. I think that's a great insight into like where your career can eventually end up. I think, you know, when I was certainly in university, I thought you had to work for one organization at a time. You couldn't have this kind of flexible arrangement, but 
You know, you're going to be working for an AFL club whilst doing your research in the US at an incredible college, which is absolutely awesome. So I think that's great inspiration for anyone trying to think, how can I do both? Yeah, no, there's a lot of, um, especially now, like in sport, there's a lot of flexibility for people to pursue other things and um, continue working like within their field. Mm, awesome. So your role at the Adelaide uh, Crows sounds pretty niche and you've been there for what, three years now? Yeah, almost um, been on four. Yeah, since, um, yep. well, they say, I, I joined after the grand final, so there's, oh. uh, <laughs> might be a bad omen. <laughs> a, bit of a bit of a trend there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it sounds like your, your role is a lot of digital transformation as well as actual list strategy and analytics. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what it's evolved to. Like it started, um, when I started, it was around the list strategy and building out like our analytics capability when it comes to the draft and recontracting players and looking for players to trade for. Um, but then it's built out um, to a wider kind of football department, digital transformation, which is awesome. Like, um, over the last couple of years, we've had a new coach, new head of footy, and they're completely invested in this space. So, um, yeah, we're able to like implement Tableau reporting and dashboarding for our coaches, which makes their lives a lot easier when they're coming to analyse games and analyse player performance and talk to the players about how they've gone on the weekend and what they want them to do. So that's been a massive win. And then, yeah, on the list management side, like we've now developed some pretty comprehensive models for evaluating players, um, developed some apps to use during trade period, um, and that's not just all me, like it's a lot. Um, I was able to hire a data scientist from one of my previous jobs. So after sports bet, I went and joined um, points bet. And again, like just being in that sports betting space, um, there was just so many young guys that were just coming out of uni with all these great coding skills that wanted to get in sport. And um, fortunately, um, there was a young guy, uh, Dean, who lo just loved the AFL and he wanted to get into it. So um, yeah, he's been a massive driving force for building some of the stuff that we have as well. It sounds like Adelaide is just really like does this really well. Like, uh, and I mean, I haven't spoken to every analyst from every club, but you know, if you guys have got all these models, you got apps. Like, it sounds like you guys are actually transforming the way that you actually use analytics in a way. Is that right, or is am I? I hope off so. There? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there there are a lot of teams that are doing some really cool stuff in this space. Um, we just. I think it was fortunate because of my varied experience in the past, I had a vision of what I wanted to build out. Um, and there was just, it was really great. There was a lot of buy-in from everyone um, from when I started. So um, when I started, it was like Don Pike and Brett Burton were our um, head of football and coach. And then we had our list manager was Justin Reed and national recruiting manager, Hamish Ogilvy. Like they all just loved it. And they, they knew that coming off and it's, and it's a testament to them because coming off a grand final, a lot of people can rest on their laurels, but they wanted to, continue getting better and I think um, being able to implement some of the things we have has really helped us uh, with the rebuild and to kind of um, mm. probably soften the blow of the rebuild and try to turn it around as quickly as possible um, so yeah that it, it's great like the key thing um, one of the key learnings working in a sports organization and listening um, and doing a few study trips around the world is that if you don't have full organizational alignment with this analytics thing it's not going to work. Like um, sometimes teams just give it lip service and hire somebody for the sake of it. But if they don't have the input um, or the say in being able to do anything, then um, it's really going to struggle to make an impact. This might sound like a bit of a strange question, but I'm hoping your answer can kind of shed light onto the impact that you are able to have. But what's the um, best bit of feedback you've got from one of the coaches at the Crows? Yeah, the best bit of feedback I think is um, – we need things that are still usable. So it's great to have um, these models that are high tech and, you know, they're doing all these different machine learning algorithms and, um, you know, you might get a great answer, but if the coaches and, you know, the other stakeholders or the list manager can't understand it and explain it, it's going to be really hard to get buy-in and get them to use it. So I think um, sometimes what we do, like sometimes, and Dean, Dean sums this up well when we uh, talk to students is sometimes you sacrifice accuracy for understanding a little bit. Uh, within a sporting context because we're not trying to, um, you know, we're not developing the most sophisticated models in the world, um, but we do need buying because if you have the most sophisticated model and no buying, what's the point of having the model? Yeah. Um, mm. When I first started at CA, I had like crazy imposter syndrome. 
And it sounds like, I mean, and that's very common across anyone who, who enters an organization, but it sounds like you were able to basically bypass that and then say sort of like what your vision is. How was that quite difficult for you or did that just come naturally? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who would love to just kind of stand up and say, I want this for this organization, but are often probably a little bit too scared to actually stand up and, and say it. And, and just to add to that, like you're now the head of department and how old are you? Uh, 31 now, yeah. Yeah. When did you step into that head of role? Uh, so that would have been in 2019, so 29. Yeah, which is quite young for a head of. <laughs> um, but yeah, go on. <laughs> so yeah, I think it was, there's definitely a lot of that, especially coming into like the football context and a football environment at a relatively successful club. But it goes back to that organizational alignment that I was talking about, like having really good leaders and managers that are forward thinking just makes such a big difference. Um, and there's no, what's really fortunate about our club is like, there's no real insecurity or there's no one trying to undercut everyone. Like it's a kind of, we've got to foster an environment of high performance where we all want to succeed. And um, yeah, no one's trying to, um, like the ideas I had, they weren't threatening anyone's job. It was more yeah. collaborative. So it wasn't, I wasn't coming in saying, oh, well, I'm going to build a model that will tell you exactly who to pick and recruiters are irrelevant. I know that like recruiters are like the lifeblood of any AFL club and um, our guys are really talented and it was more working with them. Okay, like how can I support you to make you better? Um, and analytics, you've got the way you've got to see it and a lot of students that come in and highly intelligent people, um, they get in trouble when they work in the sporting context because they think they have all the answers. Um, the best way to describe analytics is it's a decision-making decision support function. Um, and if you can kind of understand that and work towards that, then the buy-in will come after that. So talk us through the draft night. What does that look like for you? How are decisions made? Are you having the final call? What sort of things do you prepare in advance? What's like the, the behind the scenes look of draft night for you? Yeah, no, draft night, uh, it's a very fun time. Draft and trade, trade period and draft both, they, they're awesome. So with draft night, normally in a traditional environment, <clears throat> um, last year was a bit different because of COVID. Uh, every club is at Marble Stadium and everyone's got a corporate box in there with um, monitors set up for um, like champion data who are the statistic provider for the AFL. They've created an app for um, like the draft order. So as picks come in and where teams can input their picks and as trades come in, um, everyone can see that. And then we've got our own set up with the own apps we've created. <clears throat> our national recruiting manager has um, his draft order there. So as players kind of um, get selected, he crosses them off. He loves the he loves having his big white paper and doing it, but I've tried to get him to an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> Best do it digitally. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, it's, it's a fun time in there. And so my role in there, so the national recruiting manager has the final decision on who we draft and the list manager has all final decisions on trade. So months, oh, not months, but probably a month before the draft, uh, we'll sit down as a group. Um, so the recruiters, myself, um, Dean, the data scientist, the list manager and the national recruiting manager, we'll sit down and we will um, pick apart players and come up with our final draft order. So we'll have the subjective view, then we'll have the objective view, what the analytics tell us, um, and then we'll debate. So it gets pretty um, heated sometimes. Um, like last year we had pick one and there was um, a lot of fiery debate on who we should draft. And anyway, eventually we'll, we'll all agree. And um, while, while, we, while I say we all agree, like we agree that once the decision's made, like we're all on the same page and everyone's got their chance to have their say, which is completely um, vital, I think, for any successful organisation. And then we'll have our draft order. And then we'll go about gathering intel from um, other clubs, player agents, the players themselves to kind of understand where um, the draft will end up on the night, which clubs will take which players. And then we'll see if there are any potential trade opportunities for us. And that's my major role is to assess the um, trade options that we have and then bring them to the table for us to discuss both before the draft and then on draft night, um, you know, which we've got to make decisions really quickly. So you've got five minutes between picks where um, a team might come to you with a great trade deal and you've got to assess um, the merits of that and work out if that's in your benefit, the team's benefit um, to do it. And then if you do decide to do it, then you've got to execute that pretty quickly with a call to the AFL. Um, and then you might be on the clock or you might have dropped back a couple of spots. So um, yeah, it's very, very high paced and intense, but it's, it's awesome. 
So are you going as far as thinking about potential trades based on predicted draft picks or is that too far down the track? Yeah, no, we do a lot of that modeling. Um, so you can trade with the way the AFL works is you can trade um, future picks one year in advance. So um, you can trade your current use picks and your future picks. So we're, yeah, we're thinking of, um, we do a lot of predictions on where we think the ladder will lie and it's never perfect, but kind of gives us an idea or it's more gives us like a benchmark for what, kind of value we think picks will hold in the future and then we'll yeah come up with options that make sense so if we really rate a player highly and he might be falling um okay what would we be willing to give up to go get him both in this year's picks and next year's picks um without trying to compromise the future so it's um it's a delicate balance because sometimes you fall in love with a player but you've got to always remember that yeah you might love a player this year but you can't pay overs because there's Mm. a pretty good chance you'll love a player next year as well what um so you said you basically got five minutes between picks. Um, what is like the most basic sort of thought process you go to when a, say someone offers you something for one of your top picks? Like, what do you go to straight away? Is like, okay, I've got to consider X, Y, and Z. Yeah, well, you've got to consider like the player that you would get at that pick and where you rate them. Um, then you've got to consider the offer that's coming and where if it's a future pick what um, pick that will likely be, what that pick range is. And then we kind of have an understanding of based on what pick you are, the percentage um, chance that you become a gun, become above average, become average, um, become a bust. So kind of factor that all in. Um, and then we'd also think if, if it's a uh, pick in this year's draft, we'll also factor that in. But then also, okay, who might we get here? And is the difference between the player that we would get if we stayed at our pick and the play we'd get if we traded, is that difference worth it for the future pick? And if it is, then, yep, we'll make the deal. And if it's not, then probably probably stay away from it. Gee, talk- starting to realise how sophisticated yeah. all of draft night I, is. <laughs> I thought um, draft night on my, fa- my fantasy footy was hectic, you know, a couple of minutes <laughs> between, but... <laughs> It, I mean, it sounds like it's not not far off. <laughs> yeah. we, Those fantasy models can get very intense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we might have to borrow a few models or something to <laughs> plug into our own fantasy. Binook, if I'm interviewing for your role, um, am I getting thrown into a simulation of a draft night to see how I go and then if I come out the other side, I've got the job? Or what? what's the interview process like for your role? No, I think it'll be more around... Um, so... Obviously, it will vary club to club, but it'll be more around what kind of things are you developing? What kind of things have you developed in the past? Like, what ideas do you have? Like, that's a big thing for us is, like, what ideas can people bring to the table? Um, Because we can learn off anyone. Like, so this draft app that that we use, this draft and trade app, um, I kind of had the idea for it. But then my vision and what it's become, it's become so much more than what my vision was. And that... Uh, journey it was taken on by one of our interns who was a star like he he saw it he kind of discussed with me okay what do you want from this and then I said mate just no pretty basic and then he went away spent I think two months um just in his room just hammering something (laughs) out and then the final product like I was blown away by how good it was and it far surpassed anything that I thought it could be um and that so that kind of goes to just his um, proactiveness, but also just the ideas that he has. And I think that's the key thing is, um, especially for us, like we're looking for somebody that has um, ideas that are forward thinking and um, more so than what you've done in the past, like what do you think you can bring in the future? And I think that's like a great example of someone who's identified that, yes, I might be doing an internship here and my hours might be mm. 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Or, or whatever they're doing. But if you're loving what you're doing, and can see an opportunity for to turn it into a paid role, why not take it home with you, do it on the weekends, put as much time and effort into it as you possibly can, and what comes out the other side is something incredible that leads to a bigger opportunity. 100%. And that, um, so the so Dean, who I was talking about um, at Point Spent, so he started as an intern and then he became like full-time with us. And then the other intern, Aaron, who um, you know took me up to the next level, he like still got a great relationship with him, tried to, um, help him with some roles in footy that he was pretty close to getting at different clubs, but then because of COVID, um, COVID hit. But now mm. he's got he's got a great role at Tab, and he's he's like a superstar in the industry. Like he um, he's somebody that 
if I was starting a team from scratch along with like Dean, like Aaron would be one of my first hires. And that was just how we impressed in the internship. And yeah. Sounds like coding has almost become like the way that you can just level up. You know what I mean? Like not, not everyone can code, but like if you can, it just presents so many opportunities. Like I'm just thinking Rose from, from my, from our experience at CA, like, the way you know the amount of work that goes into the apps like everything in the whole digital ecosystem like if you can code just in the most basic way that almost just gives code. you an edge like straight away code and content <laughs> yeah code and content <laughs> it's, the, it's the key so it might be a trick for young players yeah for young guys like come in because like a lot of afl clubs not many people have those technical skills so you're already a massive value add when you can do that competently I um, mean, my coding skills were very, very basic compared to what these guys coming out of uni can do. Um, I was just fortunate. I was at the right place at the right time. Um, but now, like, what these guys can do, it's so impressive that um, if you can do that, like, highlight that skill set that you've got and mm. do some stuff on the side that um, is just for your enjoyment and then show people that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned networking earlier on. Um, we probably we harp on about networking so much on the podcast but for good reason because it is just so important um what was your sort of strategy back then did you just kind of go cold email i know you you said yeah sent a few off and didn't get a reply but we sort of active on linkedin or, or who did you reach out to to try and get a break yeah so a lot of cold emails and linkedin um and phone calls so what i did going into the us was i created a spreadsheet with um, all the different teams in the NBA and the NFL and all the people that had roles that I'd be interested in and then kind of tick them off. Like, are they, am I connected on LinkedIn? Yes. Have I sent them an email? Yes. Have I reply, uh, received a reply? No. Um, and then, you know, prompted me to follow up and things like that. So I had a plan with it and then, um, yeah, that was great to go out and meet people. And then when I came back to Australia, I knew that I wanted to be in the AFL and reached out to people that were of a similar age as me. So just a couple of years out of uni that were working in the industry and just to get an understanding of the landscape. Um, and through that, through those connections, that led to connections with list managers. And, um, you know, then I built out that network, which was great. So, yeah, there was a bit of planning, but also kind of understanding who you wanted to get in touch with was really key. I was almost going to jump in after Ryan's question and say, can I make a prediction here? Because we've had a business analyst on the podcast before. His name's Aman Alwalia. <laughs> he was at the Kansas City Chiefs and we chatted to him. He, then he went to the Brooklyn Nets. He's one of the most analytical thinkers I've ever met. Same ballpark as yourself. And his process was almost exactly the same as what you described. He had the spreadsheet. He had the follow-up dates. He had the predicted you know, email uh, sequence just to guess people's email to try and get uh, a you know, cold email out. And then he just methodically worked his way through it uh, and found his way into the Chiefs. So that's awesome. Um, I have to go listen to a, yeah. So lawyers, good for blogs, <laughs> analysts, good for networking. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, it's the way to go. It's uh, <laughs> It seems yeah. to be the ticket. That's what you need to do. And then what I've learned like throughout this, like I definitely wasn't doing this at the start. It was, more throughout um, as you kind of do more and more and understand what people are receptive to is you kind of bring something to the table that adds value to them. Like that's key. Like they get, like I get hundreds of um, students, you know, over a month or a couple of month period that want to get into this. But again, like um, how are you going to differentiate yourself and what work have you done? That's just your passion projects. Like what have you done with public available data or what ideas do you have and bring those to the table? Don't just come with, oh, I want an internship and um, give me one. It's like, well, okay. Yeah. It's unlikely. Yeah. It's the um, kind of like the jab, jab, punch, Rubes. You love to <laughs> speak it. about that theory. Yeah. You can't just jump in and, and ask. You've got to kind of build up to that. But I think people are starting to catch on to that one, I think. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Binok, finally, um, if you're a student, you mentioned there's hundreds hitting you up every couple of months or so. What's one piece of advice that you would give to those students who's looking to get into sports analytics and list strategy 
that they should be doing now to give themselves the best possible chance? So I think it's go find the part of the business or the part of that area that really intrigues you and interests you and then go work on some projects that there's so much publicly available data. So if it, if it is list strategy on draft picks and success rate of draft picks and games played, go work on a project that um, you find interesting, first of all, and then you've got a bit of a portfolio of work that you can show to people that you meet. And those people, like the clubs will be really engaged with that. Like um, clubs are always looking to get better and any ideas you have, like um, it'd be really well, um, you know, well received. So that would be my one piece of advice. Like start building out your portfolio of work. Don't just, and don't wait for somebody to tell you because if somebody's going to tell you that, they've probably already investigated it and it's in the works already. So you're not really going to be able to bring something new. Just go have an idea and go for it. So like, for example, when I, um, was meeting with uh, Brad Lloyd at Fremantle. My idea was like, let's build out. The AFL's got their draft value chart. So for every pick, um, what what's that kind of worth? And that's based on player salary. But I, I thought, um, what if I tried to build one based on uh, player performance instead and how different that would be? And um, yeah, he was really intrigued by that. And that kind of got the ball rolling into conversation. So I, I kind of walked him through the model that I had and what, how I came to it. Then he asked some really good questions about, well, why didn't you consider this, this, and this? And then um, that led to a good back and forth. And then through that, he he probably thought, okay, well, this guy's pretty competent. He's got some ideas. Like I'd be keen to have him on board. And um, yeah, that's that that would be a key piece of advice. Just start working on something that you're passionate about. So if someone wants to start a similar sort of project with that kind of approach, where can they find that publicly available data? Yeah, so for the AFL, um, AFL Tables is great. It's a freely available resource. Um, and that's got data from, um, I think, even like when it, before the AFL when it was just the VFL. So there's heaps of performance data there. Um, there's another site called AFL Draft Guru, which has more of the draft pick side of things and historical drafts and how they measure things. And then um, there's a website called HPN Footy where they do, I think they work with the ABC, but they do a lot of uh, modelling and play evaluations and things like that, which is just interesting to kind of read. Um to get ideas, but also go explore other sports. So go explore soccer, go explore NFL, NBA, and the ideas that you might be able to bring from them to the AFL, they'd be really well received as well, especially some of the sports like, you know, baseball or the NFL or the NBA, which are ahead of um, the AFL in terms of analytics capabilities. Well, if you're uh, interested in analytics, I think you've just listened to one of the great pods and you've pretty much got all <laughs> the tools you need to uh, to succeed. So uh, thanks so much, mate, for coming on. Um, it's just been unreal chatting about your journey and, um, you know, just all the steps you took to get to where you are. Um, just so many practical things that people can go and do in the next few years or literally today when they're listening to this. Um, it's just proof in the pudding that, like, you know, if, if you really want to get somewhere and you've got that passion for something, um, then just do the work to get there and, and you'll make it. So good luck in the US. I'm not sure when you're heading off, but um, good luck over there and um, just good luck for the draft as well tomorrow. No, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. And just to mention, like, I love what you guys are doing here. Like, it's creating a pathway for people to get into sport, which, you know, wasn't around when, when I went to uni. And, like, I think it's fantastic. And it's, um, yeah, you guys are doing a great job with it. All righty, Rubes. Well, Binook was all time. I'm just going to put that out there now. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of made me really want to maybe be analytics, man. I'm just not sure my uh, <laughs> my maths is quite there, but <laughs> that was unreal just hearing the behind the scenes of, of what he does and the journey he has put to, put together to, to get to where he is today. What were some things that you mm. loved about that? Yeah, no, he, he's made analytics exciting. If you didn't think analytics was exciting, Ooh, yeah. well, now, now you do. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but uh, first thing I'm doing, Ryan, is I'm heading to those those websites that Binok mentioned to download the public data and create my own project to prove to AFL clubs or anyone else out there what I am capable of. You know, Binok was not missing any initiative the entire way through his career. He's just built and built and built and put himself out there and suggested ideas. And... Anybody can do it. So he listed a few places to go to. One of them is AFL Tables. Another one is draftguru.com.au. Another one is HPM. 
look them up. You can grab the data there and then you start to whack a few um, projects together. And one person who's done this extremely well, I'm going to give a shout out to one of our members here, Ryan. Mm. His name is Johnson Chung. Now, he, this is exactly what he did earlier this year. I think it was May or June. I saw Johnson posting on LinkedIn all about the data that he was um, using on AFL games and he'd make a dashboard and then he'd take a screenshot of that dashboard or take a live video of it in some cases and share it on LinkedIn. And by doing so, thousands of people can see what Johnson is capable of. And one of the people who saw his posts was a person at Huddle and that person asked Johnson to apply for an Adelinix job there. He applied for it. He went through four rounds of interviews. He eventually got the job. So there's a great example of mm. how posting your work, taking on projects can lead to future opportunity. I'm going to make a movie reference here. It's quite random because we don't do movies on this pod very often, but kind of reminds me of Moneyball. Have you seen Moneyball? No, I haven't. Oh, my God. Well, that's your homework. But for those listening, one of the great movies of all time, Pete, who is a main character in there, basically has did what you just said there, Rubes, uh, did his own work behind the scenes, uh, came up with this sort of like a, a formula in which they can build the team around and then basically convinced Brad Pitt to, to bring him onto the, uh, the team. Uh, so if anyone's seen Moneyball, it's kind of the same thing. Um, but I'll get back on track. We're talking about uh, <laughs> Binnock here. But my thing that I loved was, uh, you know, and, and what I would urge people to do is to take uh, Binnock's advice and make a network master sheet who basically, you know, he built this sheet of who he wants to speak to in the industry over in the US, here in Australia. And he essentially went through and ticked them off one by one. And he just built this absolute master sheet. So I would encourage anyone out there who say you want to work in basketball, go and find people who like are relatively close to where you're at, maybe a couple of years ahead of you, um, whatever it might be, but go and find those people from every single NBL team and tick them off. Just go and do it. There's nothing stopping you doing that. Uh, it, it worked for Binook. Uh, and as we said at the start, he's a quite an elite networker. So mm. I would encourage you to do that right away. Mm. And if you need more evidence that this approach is brilliant, uh, listen to our good friend, Aman Alawalia from the Kansas City Chiefs uh, in episode 58 or head to episode 100 where we took the exact clip that he spoke yeah. about networking and, and chucked it in there just to reference again because it is it is so brilliant. And Binox just brought it up again. But um. <laughs> Finally, Ryan, uh, the third thing I'd be doing is just look for internships or jobs, not with like, you know, the end career goal in mind, but with the skill in mind that you want to develop because your end goal might require skills you don't have right now, but there will be jobs out there that won't be, you know, the sexiest role in the world or not exactly what you had in mind, but you will learn something very specific that will help you get to your next role. And Binook did that on a number of occasions. The example of points bet comes to mind. But if you're looking at a job and thinking, no, nah, this is my dream job, think about how it might be able to springboard you to the next level. I love that last point. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think just so relevant that there's so many opportunities right now that I, I literally, I'm looking at them daily, Rubes. Like there's so many internships, whatever it is, and they're perfect opportunities to go and hone a skill, even if your dream is not to work in that specific area. At least you know mm. it. It's all knowledge. It all comes back and, and meets. You know, it's just knowledge for everybody. So I love that last point. Mm. The, particularly like around content, like there's so many opportunities to create content. Mm. And you don't have to be a brilliant designer to create content. But if you create content, you might get to a point at some point in your career where you want to be, you know, I don't know, a head of strategy or a head of commercial or a head of anything, any of those departments, you've got to make presentations. If you've spent three years as a student creating content for a little Instagram football you know, yeah. account, then your design skills are going to carry over. And I can tell you right now, I've seen a lot of PowerPoint docs made by a lot of very experienced people who haven't created a lot of content in their time. <laughs> so yeah. any design experience you can get now while you're young is going to be extremely valuable. 100%. Like, 
I would have loved to do a social media internship before I went into mm. say the commercial team because I, I like you understand it in time. But imagine if I had that knowledge prior, and it's only mm. it's probably a, a I don't know. It could be six weeks, could be six months. What's that? You know what I mean? Would have been perfect. Um, so you, you've got a little exclusive here for us to end the show, which is huge. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, for um for the first time, we're bringing one of our podcast guests directly from the podcast into our membership. So those members get excited. Binook is going to be doing a webinar with us on the eighth of December. He's going to be teaching us how professional teams trade players and how they develop the analytical models behind it. So I'm absolutely pumped for this because I think there's probably a direct correlation that I can take from this into my fantasy football team. So I'm excited for that. But for anyone who wants to learn how Binook does his job, become a member. It's absolutely fantastic. The community is an extremely supportive place. There's plenty of resources to help you upskill, become more employable, become more connected. There's a ton of exclusive jobs that are just going to that cohort of people. Uh, and we've got sensational people like Binook who are, you know, experts in the industry, leaders in the industry who are coming in to teach you exactly what they do and how they do it. So the opportunity to learn directly from Binook um, is uh, is an incredible one. So make sure you jump on that. And even if you're listening to this recording and the 8th of December's passed, don't worry. We, re- we record every single session so you can listen back to it at any point in time. I had a little um, a, a little brief chat to him just after we went, you know, we, we chatted initially the other day on the phone and this uh, webinar is going to be quite cool and I, I'm very mm. excited for it. So it's never, there's never been a better time to become a sports web member. I can tell you that right now. Yeah, absolutely. All righty. Uh, well, be sure to connect with us on LinkedIn. We'd love to chat with you on there. You can find a link to our show notes uh, to do so. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.